If you had your Bibles today and you would join me in the well-known first chapter of the book of Romans chapter 8, the first verse I should say of the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 beginning at verse 1 and we will read through verse number 8. I'm going to talk to us for a while today on the topic, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. The law of the spirit of life in Christ. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 8 and the King James text today reads, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The law of the spirit of life in Christ. If you bow your heads with me another moment, King Jesus, Master, Savior, Redeemer, dearest friend I've ever had. We love you. We love the Word of God. We love this sacred text which has been given to the church of the living God as a love letter, as a means of the conveyance of peace and joy and hope and salvation. Master, how we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. How every man and woman who would stand in the sacred desk seeking to deliver a word that might be of benefit to the people of God. How we need the anointing. We need the touch from heaven that allows our lips to speak sacred truths with divine authority in love so that the hearer might receive it in their heart and not merely in their hearing. O oh, Master, today engrave upon the tablet of our heart this word which is about to go forth. Enable me, allow me to speak only that which you would have me to speak to remain silent where I need to remain silent. Encourage, inspire, and bless today every hearer. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. 
Amen. Praise God and amen. It is amazing to me having grown up in a fundamentalist evangelical church. It is amazing to me how evangelicalism preaches on one hand that Jesus Christ delivered us from the law of Moses. We are no longer bound by all the rules and all the regulations and all the demands and commandments of the Old Testament law. They are no longer binding upon us if we are to be saved. Now salvation is contingent only, they say, upon our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that's what they say to get us to the altar. That's what the Baptist preacher says to get you down front to pray the sinner's prayer. That's what the Methodist preacher says to get you down front to shake the preacher's hand. That's what the Presbyterian preacher says to get you to come and join the church. The only problem is their message is changing. It alters. The moment you've come to that altar and prayed through, the moment you have converted and changed your mind and turned around and moved from being an unbeliever now to a believer in Christ, all of a sudden their message becomes Thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. You must do this, you must do that. If you do this, you'll miss heaven. If you do this, you will not be included in the rapture. If you say this, if you go here, if you do that, you will miss out on salvation. You will have forfeited the grace of God. My God, what's wrong with you people? That is not the message of Christ. We do not simply exchange one law for another law in the conventional sense. We do not simply exchange the law of Moses for a whole new set of rules and regulations, which by the way, according to First Baptist Church, a lot of them come from the law of Moses. Gay people, LGBT people are excluded from the church. They're excluded from heaven according to them because their faith in a risen Christ just doesn't cut the mustard. You've got to change who you are. You've got to change what you feel. You've got to change your entire orientation or heaven is not available to you. If that means you must go through years of therapy, then you must go through years of therapy. If that means you must spend decades of misery and depression suppressing what you feel and what's going on inside of you, suppressing your natural human desire for companionship and love and intimacy, then so be it. You know, it's always easier for somebody who is living it to impose it upon somebody who is living it. They don't know what it feels like. They don't know the experience because they're not having to live the experience. But it's interesting how according to so many in the church world today, we have simply exchanged one set of rules and one standard of living for a new set of rules and a new standard of living. But Paul tells us today in our primary text, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me 
be free from the law of sin and death. He then goes on to explain that the law of sin and death that was delivered to the nation of Israel by the prophet and the leader Moses was dependent upon the flesh. Everything about that law concerned itself with our human existence, how we did things, how we approached things, how we thought, how we acted. And Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1 through 8, that as a believer and a child of God, we no longer are under a law that is all about our flesh. But now we follow a whole new rule. And that rule is one that is governed and administered by the Spirit of Almighty God. We're no longer bound by a law that is flesh-bound, but rather we are now bound to a law that is spirit-bound. So therefore, there's a very different, if not completely opposite, nature to the new law we are under versus the old law that the nation of Israel was under, if I tell the truth. Now we tend to think of the term law as speaking of rules and regulations established by governments and authorities which are enforced by law enforcement and the judiciary. But there is another definition for the term law that rises even above this. There are laws which exist which are unchanging and absolute whose influence we cannot escape. You see, you can break a speed limit, but you cannot break the law of gravity. Not unless you're Superman. Am I telling the truth? You see, one law, you actually are capable of breaking. The other law you are bound by, and there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. Oh my goodness. I'm here to tell you today, church. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. The law of the flesh, the law of sin and death, the law that was delivered by Moses at Mount Sinai to the people of God is a law of rules and regulations that you are capable of breaking. But the law of the Spirit, see, there's the key. The law of the Spirit it's not a law based on the flesh. It's a law based on the spirit. The law of the spirit of life in Christ. You as a child of God cannot break those laws. Oh, they are binding upon you simply because you are now a citizen of the kingdom of God. And you are subject of that kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you the good news is those are some mighty wonderful laws. <laughs> hallelujah. I'm going to share a few of them with you today. They will not be exhaustive, but I'll share a few. The laws which exist for those of us in the kingdom of God are unchanging and absolute truths whose influence we cannot escape. There are laws in the natural that follow this pattern. 
the laws in the natural that follow this pattern, they're absolute. They cannot be escaped or the law of gravity. There are what we call the seven natural laws through which everyone and everything on earth is governed. These seven natural laws are the laws of attraction, the laws of polarity, the laws of rhythm, the law of relativity, the law of cause and effect, the law, the law of gender gestation, and perpetual transmutation of energy. If you study in college, Science, you will learn that those are the seven natural laws. Most of us know the story of a man named Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton is credited with not so much discovering as putting to words the law of gravity. He is said to have once, as you see in my illustration today, he is said to have once been sitting under an apple tree. And one of the apples touched by the wind was broken off of its stem and fell to the earth and landed right smack on his head and gave him a good bop on the head. And all of a sudden Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, came up with the concept he was able to commit to words what goes up must come down so it's impossible for you to throw something or project something up into the atmosphere without it ultimately returning back to earth again this is the byproduct of gravity well, I've got news for you. God has some laws that we're under today. But you see, when we are delivered by grace from the law of Moses, the law of sin and death, listen to me, we are brought into a spiritual existence. And in that spiritual existence, we do not have, listen carefully, we do not have rules and regulations. It's kind of like moving from a place where they have laws, speed limits and laws about many different actions and activities, and moving somewhere where all of a sudden they don't have any laws, they don't have any rules. The Apostle Paul said, All things are lawful for me, didn't he? He said, But all things are not expedient. He said, Even though I'm able to do basically anything I want to do, that doesn't mean it's necessarily wise or smart or beneficial or constructive for me to do anything I want to do. A lot of things believers are instructed not to do. Not because you're going to wind up in hell over it. Not because you're going to forfeit your salvation over it. But because even though you may not be breaking the spiritual law of the spirit and of life in Christ, you are still doing something that isn't expedient. It's not good for you. It's not constructive. Ultimately, it may do you harm in this life. Smoking, for instance, might be one of those examples. I grew up in the church. My God, I literally looked at cigarettes my entire life. Every time I saw a cigarette, to me it was sin. If I saw a person put a cigarette to their lips, it was like I was literally watching them sin because that is the mindset that I was raised under. That is how I had been taught concerning smoking cigarettes or pipes or uh, cigars or tobacco of any kind. It was sinful. It was wrong. You'll miss heaven for doing it. 
No, you won't. But, just because you might not miss heaven over it doesn't mean it still can't kill you. Just because you might not miss heaven over still doesn't mean it can't cause you a lot of hurt and a lot of injury and a lot of harm in this life. There's a reason why God tells us not to run around and live the life of a whore. Oh my God, Pastor, did you say that? You're supposed to be an LGBT affirming pastor. You're not supposed to say things like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. All things are, le are, are lawful for me, but not everything is expedient. Living the life of sexual promiscuity is empty. It is psychologically destructive it can be as those of us who have come up in the age of AIDS and HIV know it most certainly can be physically destructive a lot of times you know I've preached for many years many people do many different things for many different reasons mm -hmm. Preachers love to look at the promiscuous and say, they're all pleasure seekers. They're all just running after sexual and intimate pleasures, you foolish person. No, they're not. No, they're not. Take a child who's been molested. Take a child who's suffered sexual abuse at the hands of a family member. And as they get older, they come to believe that the only way on earth that they are valued in the world is sexually. The only value they have to anybody at any given time is sexually. And they will run around and they will try at every turn to find someone, listen to me, who will value them. To them, sexual intimacy is tantamount to acceptance. It is emblemic of love. It is emblemic of approval. And when they go out and they experience something with one person and that person walks away and never again talks to them or sees them or even tries to be in contact with them, they move on to the next person. Not because they give a flying fig about the pleasure aspect of sex. That's not why they're doing it at all got news for you. I could go down a list of my own of reasons why different people do the same type of behavior. And even though it's the same behavior, the reasons why people engage in these behaviors differ. Each person has a different motivation. Each person has a different reason for doing the things they do. Say, okay, Pastor, what was your point? My point is this. I repeat, Paul said, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Honey, you're running around trying so hard to be valued, trying so hard to be accepted trying to, so hard to be loved. Been there, done it. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about this, you know, from somebody else's perspective. I've been there. And you keep going from one partner to another partner to another partner seeking the same thing and you never find it because there are people out there who have other motivations different reasons for pursuing sexual conquest than you have. And there's an old saying, if you keep doing 
the same thing the same way and getting the same results, something is wrong. You need to stop and you need to contemplate for a moment. Maybe I should do things differently. Because I know from personal experience how empty and painful it is to jump from bed to bed seeking to be loved and valued and consistently over and over again being rejected and hurt. And I'm here to tell you today a relationship with God based on faith in Jesus Christ can make a world of difference. It can fill holes in our lives that nothing else can fill. So even though everything Paul said is within my rights to do, that doesn't mean that everything is good for you. Do you follow what I'm saying? So we leave a land of law and a land of mandates and a land of rules and regulations and we enter a land of libertarianism where basically they say we have no laws on the books. We do not try to bind you up in any way. You can do whatever you'd like to do. However, we do have this handbook. In the church, we call it the Holy Bible. We do have this handbook. And in this handbook, there is wisdom that transcends centuries. There is knowledge and experience. There is advice and counsel that is offered. And if you will follow this wisdom, you will find that your life will be the best life you can possibly have. What kind of wisdom? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If you do these things, you'll find that life will be wonderful. It'll go so much nicer. You'll have so much better an experience if you do things God's way. The problem is, we got all these people in the church over here who think they've traded in Moses' law for Jesus' law, and Jesus' law is full of rules and regulations. And guess what they're not doing? They're not living according to the wisdom and the counsel and the advice of Scripture so that we can have the best possible life. That's what they're not doing. Because they're focused on not doing all the things that they are told they're not to do. Oh my goodness. See, there is therefore now no condemnation. Listen carefully to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Oh, oh, oh. they're not living over here in the land of a new law, a new set of regulations, a new set of rules, a new set of mandates, a new set of commandments. They're living over here in the Spirit land where you're free God says, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to let you be. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Where on earth is the rest in this message they're preaching over here? I grew up in it. God news for you, honey. I didn't have any rest till I finally came out and was honest with myself and honest with my God. And after three years being out in the world doing every kind of ugly, ungodly thing I could think to do, when I finally reconciled myself with God and finally reconciled myself with grace and finally understood the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, guess what I found? I found the rest that I was promised as a kid in the pew of an assembly of God church. But 
that rest was never available to me all the years I was in that pew because I was constantly under the weight of condemnation and guilt. But Paul said in Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. Does that mean they never do wrong? No. Of course you do wrong. Does that mean they're perfect, they're sinless? No, not at all. But there's no condemnation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> all things are lawful for me, Paul said. All things are lawful, but not everything is expedient. What is he saying? There is therefore now no condemnation. If everything is lawful for me, then where does the condemnation? There is no condemnation because I'm not breaking any laws. I may be doing things that will harm me. I may be doing things that are not good for me. I may be doing things that may end my life a lot sooner. I may be doing things that are robbing me of my joy. I may be doing things that are robbing me of my peace. I may be doing things that are robbing me of the life that God wants for me to have. But there is no condemnation. Because... My entire life, my entire walk is based upon faith in a resurrected Christ. I may be imperfect, I may, I may falter, I may do a lot of stupid things, but I'm doing everything in my power to walk a spiritual walk. You hear what I'm telling you now? But here's the interesting thing. You go from a land of rules and regulations over to a libertarian land without rules and regulations. But are you without law? No. No. Why? Well, because both sides live on earth. That means both sides are subject to gravity. That means both sides are subject to cause and effect. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, why? Because those laws govern everybody regardless. You can't break those laws if you want to. Well, as a believer living over here in the spirit, living over here in the libertarian side of existence, walking after the spirit rather than walking after the flesh, guess what? We live under a new law. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ. You can't break these things. You cannot make these things not work. These laws apply whether you like it or not. Listen to some, some of... Let me start first quickly with some of the advice and the counsel that God gives us so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 38, the Lord Jesus said, But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. I don't know an evangelical person who lives this. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank ye, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. 
But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Now listen. Now we start to read about some of these unmutable laws that exist in the kingdom of heaven. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Try to break that law and see. Try to throw that ball in the air and see if it doesn't come down. You can't do it. No, this is one of the laws that applies to us because it doesn't matter what you do or how you do it, you're not going to be able to break this law. You cannot make this law ineffectual. This is a guaranteed, absolute truth that applies to every believer. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh my goodness. Now we're reading about the law of the spirit of the life in Christ. Judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Throw it up in the air. It's going to come down. That's what he's saying. If you notice everything he's saying to do there's a reaction. There's something that happens in response to that action, right? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Notice he doesn't say give, and it may be given unto you. No, 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 no. This is a law. This is an absolute. Oh, hallelujah. This is an absolute. I'm going to tell you. I, I, I'm going to say this and people can find fault with it all they want to. I've been a giver for the better part of my life because I grew up around givers. My grandfather was a giver. That man had given the shirt off his back. He was one of the most generous giving people I ever knew. My grandparents tithed every day of their life. Um, they loved the Lord and they were faithful in tithing. They were faithful in giving. They supported missionaries. My grandfather used to take a, a small, uh, from his retirement, that come in every month, you know. He told my grandmother, he said, just give me, I, I want to save $300 a month to have money in my pocket for the month, you know. And she would give him every month 300 and she'd pay all the bills and the mortgage and all that, house, car payments. And my grandfather, I saw him on many occasions. At the start of the month, the church would have a missionary come by. And my grandmother loved to invite missionaries into her home. She counted it a blessing to be able to host a missionary, somebody who was putting their life on the line to be in a foreign country to preach Jesus to someone who would otherwise never hear. And my grandparents loved to have missionaries and visiting ministers and stuff in their home. They were poor people. They weren't wealthy. They, they you know, I, they, Grandma called herself poor. I don't call her poor. I, they were working poor or whatever, you know. They raised ten children, but after the kids were out of the house and married, you know, they did fairly well. But, I mean, they lived in a very simple house. They drove simple cars. They were not fashion bugs who tried to always have the latest fashion. They didn't care about having all the latest technology and what have you. They lived very simple lives, but they loved to host missionaries and visiting preachers and stuff. I don't know how many times that missionary would be ready to leave their house to go to the Sunday evening service at church my grandfather would give him a handshake and inside that hand was his 300 not 30 not 50 not 100 but the whole monthly allotment that he had that's how my grandfather was i grew up seeing the example of 
a giver. And I'm going to tell you something. My grandfather had people given to him every time he turned his head. Somebody was giving him something. Because listen to what Jesus said. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down and shaken together and running over. Meaning you're going to get more back than you gave. He said, shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Oh, hallelujah. Children of God, <laughs> this is a law of the spirit of life in Christ. Oh, hallelujah. If you give, if you give, if you throw that ball in the air, it's going to come down. Oh, my God. I don't know about you. I'm starting to get happy a little bit. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Oh, hallelujah. When you're living in the spirit, when you're living on the spirit side, all of a sudden, you don't have the rules and regulations, but you do have laws that govern your existence. Give and it shall be given unto you. Oh, hallelujah. When I started our affirming ministry, I had pastored in the mainstream before I came out in 1989 and started my affirming ministry in 1993. In all the years that I had ever pastored, in the mainstream I never for one thing I always had people who tithed that supported the church so that that we were never hurting because the people that I pastored knew how to act right so that was not a problem when I came into a affirming ministry that has been a problem from minute one and 30 years later it's still a problem But, I've always been a giver. Our church gives a minimum. We're, we have no people. We have no local members at the moment. We've already given $1,500 this year to World Missions to a program that supports apostolic preachers' children who are on the mission field to pay for clothes and things that they need on the mission field. That's a program we support. $1,500 this year we gave. Every year for the past several years we've given a minimum of $1,200 I believe in giving. Oh, do I believe in giving. I started my affirming ministry. We hadn't existed for more than maybe two years. When I met a man in New York City, a, a, a Baptist man, a member of the LGBT community, I had no idea what he did for a living. I had no idea what kind of financial situation he was in. I had no idea. I don't know. I don't know. How do you know about people? You know, I met him. He was a stranger to me. He visited one of our services in New York City, and after the service, I asked him, so did you enjoy the service? And he literally looked at me. I'll never forget it. He literally looked at me and said, no, not really. Nobody has ever said that to me. Usually people lie and say, oh yeah, it was nice, you know, and then they may leave and you'll never see them again. But this guy looked me right in the eye and said, no, not really. I was flabbergasted. I didn't know what to do. I've never had anybody say, then he looked at me and he said, I, I, said, I, I said that bad. He said, my pastor is an old man. I've been, I was born and raised in the same church I'm attending now. I've had the same pastor since I was a kid. He said, he's an old man. He said, 
he lost his fire so many years ago. Now I'm used to an old man getting up and doddering on and talking, you know. He said, I'm not used to somebody preaching with such passion. And he said, I, I've kind of gotten out of the habit of hearing that, you know. He said, but I want to ask you a question. He said, even if I don't attend your church, could I support your church? Financially, could I give in support of your ministry? He said, because honestly, I think what you're doing is wonderful and I think it is so needed in the LGBT community. I think we need what you're doing. He has told me in recent years, he said, you're the only preacher I know in our community who genuinely, sincerely preaches Jesus. You preach the Word of God. You're not preaching social issues. You're not preaching uh, news of the day, current events. You're preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You're preaching the Word of God. And he said, i got to tell you, now he watches our services online, and he's part of our church online after all these years. He said, but I, I appreciate your ministry so much because you do what others are not doing. Long and short of it, that man began to give way back in like 1995, 96, somewhere around there. And over the years, when we've had a need in the church, if he heard about it, He'd send me a check. Here you go. That'll cover it. There were times when our church, when our ministry literally faced having to just close shop and shut down. And all of a sudden, here came a check from this man. His giving would often be a surprise. We didn't know it was coming. It would, you know, he didn't give like on a regular uh, schedule or anything and he didn't give specific amounts all of a sudden his checks were larger they were bigger they all of a sudden you know we Tommy and I'd be going into debt all year long to try to help the church get what it needed and pay our rent and pay our bills because we had some people but not a one of them tied not a one of them give a nickel and this is something we've gone through for decades folks that's why I said, don't you be lackadaisical in your giving because you think we got plenty in the bank. No, no, no. You don't know. We're going to be right back to the same old mess we've been in before if we can't stay ahead of the game. Let's stay ahead of the game. This man all of a sudden, he'd send a check and it would cover all our indebtedness for that whole year. Do I believe, give, and it shall be given unto you, press down, shaken together, run it. Oh, oh, you better believe that. There's a reason why God put that man in touch with me. There's a reason why he has said to me, he said, have you ever thought, you know, how God puts you in my life and how he put me in your life and, and it's like you need me and I need you and he just put us together for a reason. He said, I really believe that, and of course, I absolutely believe it because this ministry probably would have had to shut down on a dozen different occasions if it hadn't been for this one man. Making up for the failure of the masses to do the right thing. Do I believe in giving it shall be given you better believe I do? It's an immutable law. It's like gravity. Honey, you can't break this law. There is no way. Just try it and see if you can. There's another law. When the believer understands that they live and are subject to a different, specific, God-ordained law, not of rules and regulations, but of immutable truths, they find the secret to living under the blessing and favor of God. 
John chapter 3 verse 16. Many people read this and they don't understand they're reading a law of the spirit of life in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh hallelujah. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Try to break that law. Hallelujah. See if that law isn't true. See if that law doesn't apply to every believer. Hallelujah. Oh, go ahead and see. If this is not an immutable, eternal truth that applies to every believer, hallelujah to God. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The Lord said you're looking for answers. Ask. You're seeking knowledge. Ask. You want the truth? Ask. There is a law that you live under. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. There is a law that you live under. If you ask, you're going to get it. Oh, hallelujah. If you seek, you're going to find it. Oh, my God. If you knock, it's going to be open. Oh, hallelujah. 1 John 1 and 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Try and break that law. Try and see if that law is not absolute. Try and see if God doesn't honor His Word. Oh, no, no, honey. When God speaks, it's as sure as the law of nature. Oh, my word, have mercy. Told you this to be an encouraging message today. <laughs> Thank you. Malachi 3 and 10. For all you folks who think tithing is a waste. It's an exercise in futility. I feel sorry for y'all. I was pastoring my first church 40 years ago. And I never wanted people to believe, and I still don't want people ever to think that our church and our ministry and this preacher is about money. Because honey, money for me is, is nothing. I don't care about money. I'm not trying to be rich. I'm not. A, I've pastored in the LGBT community for decade after decade after decade without a paycheck, okay? It's not about money for me. I could care less about being rich. I'm not interested in wearing the finest clothing, Tommy will tell you, half the clothes in my closet come from thrift shops. And I'm happy to say it. I, I'm not ashamed to say it. Okay, I don't, I'm not even remotely interested in keeping up with the Joneses or impressing anybody by the label of the, clo of the clothes I wear. Or you don't see me wearing rings. You don't say, honey, I promise you, you see me wearing a watch, I'll tell you, I've been doing this since my holiness days. I wear a $30 plastic Casio. You will never in your life see me wear an expensive, costly gold watch. Never. I, I, it makes me sick when I'm sitting in the pew and looking at a preacher and he's wearing thousands of dollars worth of gold on his fingers and around his neck. He's wearing a thousand dollar suit and a four hundred dollar pair of shoes. That foolishness makes me sick. I don't have time for that garbage and I'm not going to live that way. But I'm going to tell you something, I've been tithing since I was a kid delivering newspapers. And you will never tell me in a million years that tithing doesn't work. 
you will never tell me in a million years. People say, oh, the tithing, that was the law. That was under the law. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, tithing was as much voluntary in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. There was no punishment for tithing, or excuse me, for refusing to tithe in the Old Testament. The church, the, the, uh, the Jews had no prescribed punishment. You know, if somebody doesn't tithe, they don't have access to the temple, or they don't have access to the synagogue. Nothing like that existed. But listen to this immutable law of the spirit of life in Christ. In Malachi 3 and 10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. That means that those who serve in the house of God may be fed, that they may eat. Tithing was meant to support the ministry, the Levites, the ministers. He said that there may be meat in my house. Listen, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Prove me, he says, my Lord. He's actually saying, put me to the test and see. What, Lord? See what? Listen. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Oh, hallelujah. We're not rich. We don't have a lot of money. We, when Tommy and I tried to move from Dallas to Alabama, we had to hire seven pods, seven 16-foot moving pods to move all our crap. <laughs> to move all our stuff. I've got tools and all kinds of stuff. Back in the day when I was in better health, I used to love to, to work around the house and do carpentry and do all kinds of stuff. I have all kinds of power tools. i got all kinds of tools. Honey, God has blessed me so. When I came out in 89, that same year, a lady sold every single thing I owned, literally. All I had left was a, a bag, a, a suitcase full of clothes, a Bible, and the Bible uh, concordance that I still have to this day. That's all I owned, and that's all I had. A lady who was supposed to be a friend of mine sold every possession I owned. Look at me today. Am I wanted for having lost everything? No. I'm like Job. God's restored me three times over, or seven times over, or ten times over. Hallelujah. I believe in tithing. I'm going to tell you right now. God's blessed me with two cars in the drive point. I got one to pull my trailers with. I got three trailers. Got a camper. <laughs> We've got way more than most people in our our budget, in our income level. Of course, I'm thrifty. I believe me. I find bargains. I don't buy anything at full price by any means. I got one vehicle. My my navigator to pull our trailers with. It's a 2012, it's not new, it's not, you know, the latest. I could never afford a new one, but I love the one I got. I got a Ford Taurus, because I need something I can drive around every day that doesn't gobble up gas like it's going out of style. And the Taurus gets about, literally gets almost twice the gas mileage of the Lincoln. Sweetheart, yeah, my Taurus is a 2013. It's older. It's not new. I don't care. I'm as happy as a pig in mud. I love what God allows me to have. And He allows me to have an awful lot. Amen. For somebody 
who's on disability and doesn't even have a paying job. I want to tell you today, believer, there are immutable laws that believers live under. There is binding upon our lives as are the laws of gravity and the laws of cause and effect. Just as sure as what goes up must come down, the laws of the spirit of life in Christ are absolute and unchanging. We can know that the promises of God are sure. Hallelujah. We can rely upon every word He has said. He does not speak empty words into space, but every word spoken by the Lord becomes an absolute law binding upon the hearts and lives of all who will live under its reach. Many lose out on their walk with God because they believe they must embrace and live up to a law of do's and don'ts. But the truth is this, the law of the spirit of life in Christ is a code of divine promises and guarantees which the people of God can count on. Divine justice is never in question. In this life, justice is often denied. But in the courts of heaven, justice is always absolute. The law of the spirit of life in Christ is the source of our greatest joy and comfort. It is not the source of our highest anxieties and fears. Hallelujah. When we learn the nature of the law of the spirit of life in Christ, when we learn it is binding and absolute, dependent only upon our ability to trust them through faith in God's unchanging word. Our anxieties vanish and our fears are cast into the abyss. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm happy to live today under the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen.